I think the hardest job is going to be following up from Sheila, actually. So. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you very much for uh, having me here. And um, my lovely wife, Sarah, is just to my uh, left uh, as well and has been very much um, part uh, of this journey alongside me every, every step of the way. So I've been um, asked to come along and give a give some insights into the Leaderville Sporting Club and its transformation over eight months. Um, I don't think it was ever on our radar, actually it was never on our radar to get involved in a local bowling club and see its transformation um, so rapidly over an eight month period. But um, we did and it's an amazing story and I, I, within that story there's, um, there's elements of inclusion, there's elements of connectedness, there's, a, there's elements of community uh, launching out of COVID, getting the time right the mix of generations and activating um, a wonderful site. So it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to be involved there. So the Leadville Sporting Club was founded in 1905. Um, it was founded by um, uh, Henry Daglish, one of the first Labor premiers. It's an inner city bowling club. It has two greens. Uh, it started off with lawn bowls and croquet. Uh, the women were off the croquet and the, the men were at the lawn bowls uh, there. Uh, small membership base of 40 uh, people and then for about 80 to 90 years they had a proud history of bowling only one um, victory uh, uh, in terms of uh, sort of a title uh, in those 80 90 years but a very beautiful humble site in a city um, heritage listed greens as well access to two train stations within the community So the Croquet Club left in the 1990s and then they uh, didn't have enough members to continue as part of their pennant lawn bowls. And so the membership uh, levels started to decline and only about nine months ago uh, they were down to levels of 100 members of this local bowling club. Now that membership decline is not unique to this club, it's not unique to um, any metro club or even regional clubs. There is a historic decline in the number of people bowling throughout Australia and this club was, was no different. The club very much had a membership um, base which was um, over 60s and, and male, um, especially when the croquet um, uh, players left. And my family had been a member for a couple of years because we liked the asset. It was a nice, comfortable green space. Um, our, our first son you know, um, was able to run around and, and crawl around at the site. And we just it had a, a very nice, humble charm uh, to it. So, it's all about timing often. So during COVID, uh, the West Leaderville community uh, was locked down for a period. We, you would see people in the community when you're walking uh, the street or with your pram, you'd see people at the playground afterwards. But there was a real sense of wanting to belong and to connect after being shut down for, for so long. So a group of fathers began to talk in the community and then they shared their numbers and then they started up a, a WhatsApp group for those that are familiar with WhatsApp. And that little group grew from five people to 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 to 40 local dads in the community. And then of course, that relationship grew over a couple of drinks. And then of course, in Australia, it grew to kicking the football and then um, they grew to bring the children along to, to kick the football as well. It was at that time, um, at the end of last year, that the group of dads said, well, we actually need somewhere else to belong to. We're just really catching up via this WhatsApp group on a local park. You know, is there somewhere in our community that we can belong to? And then at the time we said, well, this is bowling club down the end of the road. Why don't the 40 of us sign up as members and we'll see if we can get a few of us on the committee. And so the next time we caught up, we handed out 40 forms to the people in, at, the, um, at the, the night for kicking the footy. And then we submitted the 40 forms the, the following day. Now the committee at the time and the 100 members of the time were completely shocked. Uh, the first thing they thought is these are developers, they're coming in to take over. <laughs> and there was all sorts of wild rumours flying around everywhere. Um, but we, we signed up, so membership went from uh, 100 in September to 140 in October, and then the AGM occurred. And at the AGM, um, it was, they've never had multiple people going for multiple roles, and three of us got elected uh, onto the committee. And so this is the group of dads at one of the first uh, groups we had at the site, and 
I joined the committee, I became their vice president, uh, another father became a treasurer, another father became a general committee member. And that was really the, the spark that then led to a whole range of issues that I'll, I'll talk to next. We all joined because we wanted to belong somewhere. We loved the humble nature of the asset, we loved its green space, we loved the fact that it's walking distance to a member, uh, number of people in the community, and it had a lot of untapped potential. So the first thing we, we noticed when we joined was that here was a place that not many people knew about. Um, it, not many people had ever gone to go bowling there. People lived next door to the asset and never went to socialise there. And they didn't tell anyone they were there or, or what they did. And they never actually then spoke to their members about what they liked about the club and what they didn't like. So we set out um, first to, to think about those things and then to develop a, a strategy. So, the club had existed since 1905, yet we developed the first inaugural strategy for the, um, uh, for the, for the site. We went out to ask our members and guests just a couple of simple questions. So we didn't uh, engage any fancy marketing firm. Um, we simply used a uh, survey monkey, a free tool on the internet. We literally asked three questions, you know, uh, what do you like, what, do you don't, what, what don't you like, and what do you want to change? And we had about 40 to 50 responses that came via that survey, survey monkey tool. And then they formed the basis of what would be the first strategic plan. And it was a very simple plan. It just set out what the committee wanted the place to be like. And that was really to be the social and recreational hub for the community. So it's not to be the best bowling club in, in metro areas or the best bowling club in Western Australia, but it was the social and recreational hub for the community. And we really wanted a, a, a club that represented the community in which we all lived. Now, having a hundred members um, who are of a certain gender and of a certain age group wasn't representative of, um, of the community in which we lived. Um, and so we put that into what our values are, what our vision was. Um, we looked at all the comments from the 40 different people who responded. And then we categorised them and said, OK, there's a bunch of people here that say, they want better drink offerings because they didn't like Great Northern and Tui's New on, on tap. And, and then there were others that say, hey, you know, we drink wine, we'd like some wine. And then there were some, some that said, well, we would like some kids' activities because there's nothing for the children to do. And other people said, um, just give us some food offering because there's, there's nothing available uh, for us to eat, so we leave. And, and then we had all these sort of um, comments came in, so we categorised them as food, drinks, entertainment, um, play, events, and then under those we set various goals for ourselves. And one of the local dads uh, happened to be a, a graphic designer, so we just asked him to put our ideas and photos into a document called the Strategic Plan. But for us, it was really about that clear vision uh, that we then went out and told everyone, we have this document and this is, uh, uh, this is our, our plan. We talked about um, the membership. Sheila talked about having a, a, um, an update of activities that went out. Our members had no idea of what the club was doing and what the future direction was. So we simply started emailing our members, because the majority of them did have email, and just said, last month, this is what we did. We had these activities occurred, we had these food trucks occurred, we've, we've applied for these grants coming up, um, there's this event you know, in two weeks' time, uh, you might not have noticed but we've changed this and we're going to change that. And you'd been, it was amazing to see the feedback, it was, oh, thank you so much you know, for what's happening, um, I feel really engaged with the site, oh, I actually know someone that can help with that activity. And this, it brought that engagement immediately um, to, to the club, uh, a simple email once every four weeks just to engage with someone, not using any fancy marketing platforms, it was just a simple email. And what we also found out, about 20% of the email addresses were incorrect because they'd been written on old uh, membership forms and transcribed in, uh, incorrectly, so we're able at least to um, get the right details. We then fired up our social media pages. So Facebook was in existence before, probably had about 15 photos that had ever been posted, it didn't have Instagram. So um, a couple of the dads who are a bit social media savvy simply just started taking photos of people at the club, some of the things that were changing, and just uploaded it um, uh, to social media. Critically, we then reached out to our key stakeholders. Once we started to have a few more people coming down, we wrote to our federal member and said, have you been down to the club? Have you seen what it's about? Have you met your community members? The answer was no. Um, the federal member came down. We, it was in the lead up to the um, election, so we reached out, the state elections, we reached out to both Liberal and Labor members um, who were contesting for the seat. 
we offered them opportunity to come down knowing full well that they would want to be seen in the community in the lead up to the election and we invited them to come down and pledge their support for various activities. We also reached out to the councillors and said, well, you realise that this key asset here is just as important as the local school. If you're interested in getting re-elected, um, come down and be seen in the community because this is where people are going to congregate. And then we reached out to relevant ministers. So a lot of people with their community clubs will just be very focused on their patch, but there's a lot of opportunities thinking more broadly. So there's, a, there's 15 or so ministers. We reached out to uh, the, the Minister for Volunteering, the Minister for Sport and Rec. We reached out to the Minister for Disabilities, reached out to the Treasurer, reached out to local members um, that, in other jurisdictions that we knew that had personal connections to people at the club, just to get them aware of the site which is really helpful when you start going for grants uh, later on. We also then befriended local businesses. There's a, there's a line that we just ask everyone at the club, what do you do? Oh, you're a graphic designer. Okay, here you go. Um, please design this document. Oh, you're a welder. You're, all of a sudden, you're designing our bike rack. So we really reached out to these local businesses and got them involved. We talked about wanting um, the club to represent the community um, in which we reside. We really wanted to attract these families down. So. We just went out and bought a whole bunch of super duper icy poles at Coles and just said to everyone, it's free icy poles for children. People would just come down and the children would know where the icy poles are. They'd grab one, they'd run around. The, the parents would have 15 minutes reprieve and could get a drink and then socialise. And um, we increased the outdoor games offering. Bowls clubs have often been about bowls, but a lot of people um, want to play a little bit of bowls and then do something else. So we just went out and bought Jenga, Coits, Connect, uh, Connect Four, um, uh, cornhole, um, ten pin bowling, a whole range of very cheap um, equipment, twenty, thirty dollars from Kmart, and we put it in a storeroom and said, if you're a member, you can use this for free. And all of a sudden, people were coming down as parents, grabbing a coit set, you know, sitting next to the bowling green and playing with it. And then we realised that a lot of people are booking corporate events, and they would say, oh, how many people are going to bowl? And you say twenty, and then you'd say, well, do you want to hire? the Connect Four set, do you want to hire um, this basketball uh, game? And then they started paying to hire that equipment in addition to the bowls and their event. So all of a sudden the equipment we bought funded itself three to four times over. We were lucky enough to have uh, next door to a playground, but it never had a gate. So you had to walk about 300 metres around the site to actually get to the playground or jump over a chair to get to the playground. Just installing a gate working with the local council meant people could come in and out quickly, which again attracted more families. And for those uh, that are members of clubs, um, if you don't have a playground next door, put one in and get a gate because that is the way to draw people uh, down. We were very, in some ways, our biggest weakness of the club was also a strength. When they lost competitive bowling, People had thought the club was in demise. But the fact they didn't have competitive bowling meant that we could be a little bit more flexible with the use of our greens. So the Heritage listed two grass greens. So we keep one in a very immaculate condition um, for the very serious bowlers, but the other green uh, for more of the casual bowlers and we allow children to run around on there. And that, you know, that, that has taken, um, that is, well, first of the kids have loved it. Um, most of the children are 20, 30 kilos, not doing a huge amount of damage to the greens, but they're having a wonderful time. In summer, the old sprinklers being dragged out of the bowling green and the kids are running out of it. Our greens are being watered at the same time, which is handy. Um, people are playing, you know, kicking the football on the greens. And so they're only coming down on key parts of the weekend to do that, so the damage to the greens isn't, isn't that great. But it was just another opportunity where people say, oh, wow, this is fantastic. Um, where could you do this? The other thing we, we did was we focused on local school reps, um, local class reps. So every school in a state um, will have a social class representative. It's usually the parent that arrives last at the meetings that they get appointed to this role. And they're meant to uh, organise a social event once a term. And they're often wondering, where, where am I going to organise this? Oh, I can't be bothered doing it. So we just developed a very simple flyer saying, hello, social class reps. Do you know you can book your social event at the bowling club? Here's the outdoor games. Here's the free icy poles. We're next door to the playground. Here's the number uh, or the email to contact us. And all of a sudden, the class, the year four class is coming down. The grade ones are coming down. The grade sixes are coming down. And your local school could to start having that uh, connection is really important because the kids come down, the parents come down, and, and so on. 
my wife and I have a son with a disability, and so we're very um, focused on making the site uh, as inclusive as possible. So uh, we're successful in getting some funding and we're building a, an accessible toilet uh, over the coming months. Our committee, we're taking on a journey about what inclusion actually means, and with the with the goal to start hiring um, a number of people in frontline customer service roles that have a disability. And we're proud to partner with Inclusion WA and Inclusion Solutions uh, on that. You have to create a reason for people to come to the site. So we talked about bowling on the grass greens. Yeah, that was always there. The opportunity to be seen with the community. Oh, I'll see you at the club on Sunday. Oh, will you be down there on Saturday morning? Just creating that community buzz. We brought a meat tray raffle down. Um, so we partnered with a local butcher. We partnered then with a, a local business who would sponsor the meat tray raffle every month. So on a, on a Sunday from three o'clock to five o'clock, we sell tickets for the meat tray raffle and it gets drawn at five o'clock. A business sponsors that every single month for four meat trays and someone gets up and reads out the ticket. And uh, it's, it's one of the reasons actually people come down. It also means that we can raise an extra two to $400 a week from raffle tickets for a meat tray that a business has bought. So we're getting an extra two to 400 just in revenue um, without actually doing um, anything for that. Food trucks, a lot of people, and including us, weren't able to hire a full-time chef and then serve out food. But a lot of food trucks are interested in coming. So it was, again, reaching out to food trucks and saying, Sunday afternoon, busy event, come down. And um, that was fantastic over summer. During winter, it's a bit more quieter. So we're not, we're not doing that so much. Just installing TVs outside, there's not many places where you can watch sport and have kids running around being barefoot, having some uh, TVs outside so you can watch various sporting events. Uh, also converting our halls to play kids movies inside to give children a, an option on, on wet weather days. When we joined the club, uh, we were told that you're not allowed to have music there, it was written to the um, the council rules, that was the Chinese whispers that had lasted 40 years and so we installed speakers and started playing music and it created the, created the ambience. So there's a range of things, but the core thing is a reason to actually come down uh, to the site. The other thing we did is we started to rearrange a few things on site. There was a lot of um, old sheds, uh, a lot of old dumping grounds and materials that one or two members um, said they was really important and we just had to validate, you know, do we need to hold those screws from the 1970s or do we need to keep that keep that old hammer when we've got five other hammers. So it was, we had to go through a big um, working bee process with 30 people from the community, and we moved a shipping container during a working bee. So we moved this shipping container, and then we said, well, let's create a mural. So a couple of our local community members who are artists came up with this brand, the Bolo. They, they wanted a contemporary brand to sit alongside the historic brand of the Leaderville Sporting Club. They, they called it the Bolo. They drew it up, they then put it on a overhead projector that projected onto the shipping container, they stenciled over it, and then they did paint by numbers. So they had uh, six different paints, so we're all painting number one, number two, number three to, to six. And then um, we created this, uh, this brand that a lot of the younger people could then say, oh yeah, the Bolo, yeah, I'll see you at the Bolo. I'll see you on Sunday afternoon at the Bolo. All the heritage of the site that existed in 1905, this was sitting in shipping containers. It was, sh it was sitting in old sheds. It was not on the walls of the site. We brought this back. It was part of the allure and the, and the charm. And this is the Anzac Day shield. On Anzac Day, there's always been a, a bowling competition. Hadn't been run for 20 years, so we've, we've brought that back now. So we really wanted to um, meld the, the, uh, the different generations and the history of the site. I mentioned the funding before. It was absolutely critical to reach out to both sides of politics. Um, and we were lucky enough to secure a $143,000 pre-election commitment uh, in the lead up to last uh, election. And that was purely just being the right place at the right time. We effectively cold called the local member of, uh, for Labor and said, have you been down to the site? No, I haven't. Come down this afternoon. She came down this afternoon. We happened to have our act together with two quotes for the six different projects that we wanted to do. We gave her a pack. 48 hours, she sent it to the Labor um, uh, election machine, and um, we had a pre-election commitment the following week for $143,000. Right place, right time, but it was about being prepared, knowing what you want, having s separate quotes, having it documented why this project was important, and then giving it to the right person at the right time. I also wanted to say that there are, there's plenty of money around in terms of various state government, federal government and other commitments. You just have to keep applying. Um, Healthway grants at the moment just came out recently and we were lucky enough to uh, obtain $4,000 of, of grant. 
for a new drinking water station, for a fruit bowl that will happen each week, for kids' cooking classes during the winter holidays. So there, are, there are various things. You just have to have some, um, some people who are, are really um, willing to fill out those applications. And I think it's the people you attract to the club that's really important. You want a diverse mix of skill sets. But you need, I think, bowling clubs need to attract the younger generations to get involved. Now, not everyone can get as involved as we have, but being able to come down for, you know, an hour on a Sunday and do something or... Um, I texted someone just on the way here saying, can you pick up some super-duper icy poles? We're out. That person's never been involved with the club before, but just bringing them in just with these little tasks here and there. Oh, you're a welder. That, would you like to do a bike rack? Oh, that'd be really fun. I'd love to do that. So get them involved, start bringing them into the club in this way. But having that, uh, that younger generation and that sense of ownership of a very small part of the project is, is really important. And this is just some of the media um, from uh, our, our journey. Um, people often ask, that's fantastic, but what, are, what about the 100 original members? What do they think? Um, I would say 99% of them are completely supportive, love the energy, love the enthusiasm and the, the direction. And um, uh, th what is happening at the site is what they wanted. We've had one or two people at the site that have said, Word for word, you know, Kane, I, I love the fact that it's family friendly, but there's just too many families here now. Um, or I really liked that drink yet on tap here, and rather than putting this new fancy craft beer on that everyone's drinking, so we kept a, a bottle for that for that person. So um, you, you just can't win. You can't win every debate. You can't win every battle. But stick to what the 99% are really keen for. Be respectful. Be consultative, and try to bring as many people along to the journey as possible. Create a really fun culture, this sense of community. It's a really relaxed vibe. We're not, got, we're not got, our, these facilities are amazing. These are 10 times better than our club's facilities. Our building was built in 1959. But it's just, it's humble. It's got a very nice, relaxed vibe. There's festoon lights outside. There's, there's grass everywhere. There's, you know, soft music playing. There's kids running around with, with icy poles and various games. And also embrace an eclectic mix of activity. Don't be afraid if you are in a sporting club to diversify from the original sport that you were started with. You know, invite that, um, the local singers down, the local music group down, get the Rotary Clubs to come into your site. Consider about becoming a, uh, an RSL. Um, on any one day, we might have a Bucks party down one end, um, being very respectful. We might have a kid's birthday party down the other end. Someone had a pony party at the club the other day. We'll have fundraising occurring for a... Um, uh, various function. Uh, four Rotary Clubs use the site. The Men's Prostate Cancer Group uses it. The Fish Breeders Association, the Vintage Motorcycle Club. So just reach out to your community and anyone that might be meeting in a cafe or in a house, convince them to meet at your club. Even if that means not charging these groups a, ho a whole high fee, it'll actually work out in the long run better for you when they start bringing down their groups and engaging uh, with you. And as I said, ask everyone what you do, because they will all have a skill set that you can use. And in closing, um, this has already been outdated. We actually, uh, on Sunday, hit 500 members. So we've had a 400% membership growth in about eight months. Uh, and not only did we hit 500 on 11 a.m. on uh, Sunday morning, we're 510 as of today as well. So that's an it's a incredible rise for, for us. Our membership is $40. Um, we haven't done any sort of formal marketing. It's been word of mouth. It's bringing in the community. It's been um, fantastic that we've had all this strong stakeholder support. We've just been nominated uh, for the Club of the Year in, in three categories. And um, we've, we're really having a growing volunteer uh, base as well. And that funding we've secured has allowed us to build a disability toilet, uh, commercial kitchen, uh, some extra fencing to make the site safe and some extra shade sale and uh, facilities. So it's been a wonderful journey, um, one that my wife and I didn't think that we'd be um, making eight months ago. And um, I just hope some of those just grassroots examples of things that we've been able to do to convert this site uh, are helpful to some of you in, in your roles. So thank you.